All righty, so we are starting a new series today. I'm super excited. I hope you guys are too. Um, it's called The Love Package, and if you look around, you see packages everywhere. Um, it's going to be really good. Today's uh, sermon topic is When Love Throws a Party, which is kind of right on with where Pastor Amber was going earlier. She tried to let us go back and party a little bit. Um, so I'm super excited. We are tying 1 Corinthians 13, which, as you guys know, is the love chapter, in with the Christmas story. So it's really neat, um, a little different than what we're used to in the Christmas season. Um, so I hope you guys are ready to uh, hear a really good word today. If you guys would help me welcome our lead pastor, Pastor Tony Moore. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad to see you. Seriously. Seems like it's been a long time since last Sunday. <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. Everybody ready for Christmas? <laughs> yeah. I, I hear no comfort and joy. I need some comfort and joy. Yeah. Do you have to go to parties? No, I said have to. Are there parties you have to go to? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> you go to parties you don't really care that much about, but you go because you feel obligated. Not family. Must be like a work party or something. We, we went to Judy's work party last night. Our first party of the season already started. But it was pretty good. Our hostess, the, the owner of the company, provided all the food. Nobody had to bring stuff. She provided all the gifts for the Secret Santa game. Nobody had to bring gifts. She gave other gifts to everybody who was there. She laughed. She was happy. Happiest person in the room. <laughs> you could tell she was giving a party from her heart. It wasn't, it wasn't an obligation. It was something that she did because she wanted to do it. It really makes a difference, doesn't it? When love throws a party, instead of when obligation throws a party. I'll just tell you this from the very beginning. Transformation House does not sit in the middle of downtown Greenville because we're obligated to. In fact, I'm sure there are people who would you know, rather we weren't. <laughs> um, no, we're here because we love to be here. We're, we're doing life in this space because we love to, because we, we love the people. Uh, I talked to a gentleman this morning before the service started, and you know, I, I told him, I said, I'm really glad you're here. I don't care if you're here for 10 minutes or three days or whatever. Um, I'm just glad that you're here because you're the reason that this church exists. You're the reason that these doors are open. Whether I can meet all of his needs or whether all I can do is offer him a smile or a prayer, what, whatever I can do, I'm here to impact his life so that he impacts the lives of the people that he touches, right? That's right. Is that why you're here? Yes. Hello? Yes. Is that why you're here? Okay, help me out. I didn't come in here to have church by myself. <laughs> Can't get no help up in this Presbyterian church. That's what I heard somebody say. <laughs> so Kristen told you that we're, we're linking together 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, with the Christmas story all, all this month. And, and I'm really looking forward. Really, I'm really looking forward to this because I think God has something to say to us. So let's just start. Let's just go to 1 Corinthians 13 and um, read verse 4 through 7. One little paragraph of the love chapter. It says, love is patient. You know that part, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love. Did you see love throws a party in there? Come on now. Really? You didn't see it? Let me read it again. Listen for it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Did you get it? Where is it? It rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices. Hey, you're smart. Love <laughs> rejoices with the truth. In other words, love doesn't jump to conclusions when it hears a rumor. It's patient. It thinks the best. Um, it waits for the truth, and then when the truth wins, love throws a party. It's the way it happens. Okay, we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians 13 in a minute. Um, but where in the world do we find love throwing a party in the Christmas story? You're going to be wrong, but yes. <laughs> 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 no takers? Anybody? Any idea? Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> Pretty good place to start with the Christmas story, the very beginning of the New Testament. Starting in verse 18, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because she because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, we're familiar with the story, right? We're familiar with the Christmas story, even if we don't know who all the Old Testament prophets are. We surely know the Christmas story. We know that, that Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married. Before the marriage took place, Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant. And it says about him, because he was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, Joseph could have divorced Mary and then had her stoned, according to the law. Are you glad he didn't live back then? <laughs> Legally, in their society, Joseph had the right, legally, to divorce his wife and then have her stoned. Um, but, something that is amazing to me, in the very, very beginning of the Christmas story, before Jesus is even born, we find the story of grace starting already. Because it says this about Joseph. He was faithful to the law, right? Joseph was faithful to the law. But Joseph did something. Even though he was faithful to the law, he took his eyes off of himself. And he considered how that public disgrace would affect Mary. It says that he was faithful to the law, but because he considered how she would be disgraced. He decided he would just quietly divorce her. Let's forget the public stoning. Let's forget the public ridicule. Let's just, I don't want to be married to you because then it will affect both of us. Let's just end it. You move on with your life. I'll move on with my life. Um, but there's that word in, in verse uh, 19. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Joseph did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. Joseph was concerned about 
Mary's reputation about Mary's life. Why? I think it's because he really loved her. I think he really loved Mary. Um, and so he, he did the right thing. Re remember the word is disgrace, right? He was, he was concerned about how public disgrace, disgrace, you know, grace, dist. <laughs> You're welcome. You can use that sometime. Anyway, he took his eyes off of himself and he considered how, how that disgrace would affect Mary. First of all, he, he saw an injustice. He felt that he had been treated unjustly. This woman is engaged to me, but she's lost my trust. I've, I've been treated unjustly. I don't deserve for my fiance to come tell me she's pregnant. Then he took his eyes off of himself and he looked at Mary and he saw injustice there. And don't you feel that sometimes for the people that you're close to, the people that you love? Don't you feel that, yeah, they did wrong. They made a mistake. They did something stupid. They made a bad decision. But they don't deserve to have to pay for that for the rest of their lives or with their life, right? You, you feel that compassion. And when, when somebody close to you has the potential of being treated unjustly, Truthfully, maybe according to the law is just. But, okay, let's set the law aside for a minute. And let's live in grace. It's exactly what, what Joseph did. He said, I know the law says this, but I don't think Mary deserves that. So he decided to, to do something different. He decided to, to have a, a private divorce to, to put her away. Um, and, and then I think he also considered the injustice that the community might put on them if they married. And it became known that she was pregnant. It wasn't his child. Um, because you know what the community was going to say in that situation. You know how they were going to respond. So, so he's facing all this in, unjust, injustice and potential for injustice. And in spite of it all, he actually did the right thing. Because it says that his, his decision was a decision of grace toward her to just divorce her quietly. But then the angel appeared to him and said, this is, this, Mary hasn't done anything wrong. This child is from the Holy Spirit. This is the plan of God for her life. This is the plan of God for your life. And so, so then his only decision then was when he woke up was to, what? What did he do? What did he do? He married her. He married her. Thank you, Darnell. <laughs> <laughs> he married her. Um, when you woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife. Verse 24. Um, so, he, so he did the right thing. Man, when, when I start using the word injustice 15 times in the first 10 minutes, <laughs> I, I bet for all of us, different pictures pop up, different images, different things that we think we've suffered, different ways we've suffered injustice, different ways injustice is perpetuated throughout our society or the world. Um, we know we live in a messed up place, right? Right. right? It's, it's obvious to us that we live in a messed up place. And you can't turn on the news without hearing the word injustice much more than I've used it this morning. Um, well, I want to tell you something, that there's no party when there's injustice. Nobody throws a party when there's injustice. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 6 that we read says that love does not delight in evil. Love doesn't throw a party when there's injustice or when evil is abounding. Instead, instead of a party, we have when there is injustice or even in some cases perceived injustice but when there's injustice in any form there are 
other things that happen besides throwing a party. Um, there are arguments. There's Senate hearings. <laughs> there are riots. There's looting. There's burning. There's unrest. There is no peace. This past week, Pastor Chris and Pastor Amber um, have posted some things in social media that have been really, really good news. You know, one of, one of the things that, that Amber said this week, um, I, she posted on Facebook, um, was that um, Transformation House is a place where issues take a back seat to people. Pastor Chris said that issues, uh, people are greater than issues at Transformation House. Well, they're, they're just, people are greater than issues anywhere, should be. Um, it, it's really, that's really the good news that we have to offer to our world in this season. So I want you to think about this. <clears throat> Don't answer out loud. But what word do you think causes the most division in the church? Don't answer out loud, because I don't want you saying anybody's name. <laughs> it's not me. Um, but what, what word do you think causes the most division in the church, or the most turmoil in a home, or the most divorces? What word causes the most damaging spiritual abuse, or the most horrendous physical abuse, or the foulest verbal abuse, or the vilest sexual abuse? What word causes the most failures at a job? all the same words. Biggest declines in education and the most divisive of political agendas. Brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, race against race, gay against straight, generation against generation, the haves against the have-nots. Got a word? I think it is I think it's me in some form my mine my career my happiness my life my way or the highway <laughs> think about it my money my time my convenience my lifestyle people who really couldn't care less about how what they do affects the church or the community or the family and certainly don't care um, can I say don't care I don't know can I say don't care don't really care they must not care or they wouldn't make some of the decisions that they make that those decisions will determine whether the people around them in their community or church family or even their own home in some cases um, come to have any relationship with Jesus now or for eternity. And we act like that person out there that we're ignoring or that we're hurting or that we're, <laughs> don't really care about either way. We act like they're not really a, a real person. You know, the person in the house next door to us that lives next door and, and we don't take into consideration how what we do affects our next door neighbor. You have neighbors like that. I'm not saying you're like that. I'm saying you have neighbors like that, right? You have people in your life who, who have made decisions that impacted your life in a way that destroyed a part of your life. Some part of you on the inside of you died because somebody close to you just really made a bad choice. Did something that wasn't fair. Treated you like you weren't even I get all that. 
you know, I, I, I've been mistreated. I've suffered abuse. I, I felt the pain of people's decisions when all they were concerned about in the moment was themselves, their own satisfaction, their own happiness, what was in it for them. <coughs> and I, I mean, in, in many different forms. And sometimes it's like, you know, it's really sad that they didn't consider the other person in that moment, right? I mean, if you're, at, if you're the one suffering the injustice, you feel the pain of it. And you understand how, how wrong that is. You understand that something needs to change in this relationship. Something needs to change in this society, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a person whose innocent child is gunned down, you feel the injustice of that and you want to do whatever you can to fix it, right? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be standing up on a chair somewhere screaming at the top of your lungs, fix that problem? Um, if, if, if you're the, the child whose parent or relative regularly sexually abused you, when you become an adult, wouldn't you want to speak out to, when you feel like you finally have a voice, wouldn't you want to speak out and say, I was wrong? I mean, don't you think if you don't know that experience, don't you think that you might just feel that boiling up inside you until it finally came out? If you're in a relationship where your partner just doesn't really consider you in any of the decisions and, and you're second class or you're always the submissive one, or, or what, don't you feel like at some point something's got to break? Something's got to change. I, <laughs> all week as I, I've been thinking about this, I've been singing, I've been lied on, cheated, <laughs> talked about, <laughs> mistreated, <laughs> been buked, <laughs> scorned, right talked about, sure as you're born. Yeah. Been up! <laughs> I've been down. Yeah. Almost on the ground. <laughs> Long as I got injured. Long, oh, no. anyway, <laughs> we'll stop there. <laughs> because I don't even like that song. <laughs> Let me tell you why I don't like the song. The song says all those things have happened, but as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. So you just go on. <laughs> I don't need you, all I need Jesus. That's not even true. If that were true, you would have been born in heaven. <laughs> the first time. <laughs> but you weren't. You're here because you need somebody. Somebody needs you. We need each other. We're in community, and Jesus created us as a, as a family, as his family, as the church, built together to encourage and to uplift one another, to make a difference in this world, not to take each other down, not to abuse and to hurt, to mistreat. But so, yes, we need Jesus. And I get the sentiment that as long as I got King Jesus, I'm going to make it. Yeah, because people are going to come and go. Amber told us that um, last week that you know we're going higher, and some of those people are going to fall away. And it's absolutely the truth. Um, I, I, it was amazing. Thank you. It was a great word last week. Um, but we need somebody. Mm -hmm. It might not be that person who fell away, but everybody doesn't fall away. There are still people in your life that are there to, to help you make it. I do need King Jesus, but I need Judy too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, there are people around me that I, I am who I am. I've become who I've become because they were there. Right. And some of them were the bad people who eventually fell away. And, and they shaped me into who I am. And I'm, I'm really okay with that. But, but this, you know, as long as I got King, it's just a little bit too me-centered for me. You know, I, I, I have a mission. I have a purpose. Um, this church, you, you, all of you have a mission. You have a purpose. You have a calling. We have been planted in the middle of a great city. 
Greenville is, it's got its problems, it's got its issues, but it's a great place to live. Um, and maybe I'm prejudiced because I was born here, so maybe I feel a little biased when it comes to good places to live. But I believe that God put Transformation House in the middle of Greenville because he wants to do something that hasn't been done here yet. I really do. I really, I really feel that. So, so what I'm hoping is that through this Christmas season and into the next year, we already have January planned. We have the theme for 2015. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's, it's already been leaked out a little bit here and there. So, so you might, you, when you, when you hear it, you're going to say, oh, I've heard that before. That's because Amber and I got ahead of ourselves just a little bit. Because <laughs> it's so good. It's just really that good. So because it's.